Aloha, and welcome to UHM TV, a news production brought to you by the journalism students from UH Manoa's School of Communications. I'm Amber Kahn. And I'm Alex Bitter. Thanks for joining us. Coming up on UHM TV, we'll take a closer look at the homeless situation in Hawaii and what's happening to help our vets. Learn how UH students are honoring the legacy of late Senator Daniel K. Inouye. Talk story with UH alum and former U.S. Representative Colleen Hanabusa. Plus, a beauty pageant that sparks awareness about transgender equality. The homeless situation in Hawaii is among the worst in the nation. As David McCracken reports, one urban area on Oahu has been a homeless hangout for decades. This is where the spot that I always hang around every single day. And, and close by to Chinatown, where all the food at and, yeah, and people come and donate food. This is Samuelu Semalu, a homeless resident of Aala Park for the past two years who hasn't been able to afford a place to live since moving from the mainland. Affordable housing is also out of his reach. Here I'm standing at Aala Park, right next to Chinatown, where Representative Carl Rhodes has said it's been a problem ever since he's been in office. We've had homeless people living in uh, Aala Park for as long as I've lived in the neighborhood, and that's getting close to 20 years now. Representative Carl Rhodes oversees District 29, in which Aala Park, an area that is home to many homeless people in Honolulu, is located in. And this is where I'm at. I'm at it on the street. I can't afford to pay no rent. And hard to get into those programs to be, I suppose, to be a seniority. I'm, I'm you know, I'm American. This is where I'm at. <laughs> yes, and thank God I we have this piece of land to hang around with it. Representative Rhodes recognizes the problem and hopes to expand affordable housing and assistance for those with mental illnesses within the foreseeable future. I mean, part of the reason we have high homeless rates is the weather, because you can survive outside, and uh, as a result, we have the highest per capita homeless of any state in the union. So Aala Park is just sort of a little miniature of what's going on there. So, I mean, we. We, we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do. We need, more, we need more affordable housing units for not just for people who are homeless, but for people who are in danger of becoming homeless. There are bills that have passed recently to do that and they're being tweaked now and you know, hopefully we'll get to the point where someone who's really far gone uh, mentally uh, can be helped, um, have a guardian appointed for them and try to look out for their best interests. With new bills being put into place, the homeless rate at Aala Park could see improvement for the first time in decades. From UHM-TV, this is David McCrack. Homelessness hits all walks of life, including those who have fought for our freedom. It is estimated that one out of five veterans are on the streets. And as Ryan Letzbeck reports, one organization is working to help those who have served our nation. In Hawaii, about 6,000 people are homeless, and an estimated 800 of those are veterans. But what's being done to help those who served our country? Here at U.S. Vets in Kapolei, the dedicated staff works hard to end veteran homelessness. We literally go to different places where we think homeless will congregate. Some of the shelters, beaches, underpasses, even in the woods. Our team will go anywhere. And we go out and we identify, you know, have you ever served in the military service? Once we identify, we're able to call up the Department of Veteran Affairs and verify their veteran status. And we're able to bring them directly in our program. No money is needed. Don't have to do anything else except for come show up and have a desire to want to start making some changes. But our program has an average stay right now now this year of a little over under four months where a client comes in, a veteran comes in, they get the services and then we move them to permanent housing. Right now in Hawaii we're moving out people in permanent housing at an 80 percent rate. So eight out of every ten veterans that come to us when they leave our program they're moving into a permanent housing setting. Army veteran Frank Villa turned to U.S. vets to get into drug treatment after being released from prison. I've been here almost 16 months um, working on uh, job search. Well, I'm working already part time. Um, I got my housing going. Um, my life is a little bit more stable because I have money in the bank now. And um, I'm just about ready to move out to get back on my own. For UHM TV, I'm Ryan Letzby. Many believe homelessness is a consequence of the lack of affordable housing. As Janelle Guerrero Miguel tells us, construction on Oahu is not keeping up with public demand. Hawaii's housing market is severely out of balance. According to state economists, more than 65,000 homes will need to be built over the next 10 years to meet population growth. Nearly half that amount is needed on Oahu alone. The key issue is supply and demand. 
okay because that's what drives price basic economics if you have a limited supply and you have uh, an increasing demand then price is adjusted upwards to meet that equilibrium and that's basically what's going on in Hawaii or actually more in Honolulu currently a one bedroom rental runs about 1500 bucks a month that's 55 percent above the national average placing Hawaii in the top tier of most expensive places to live in America for the cost that I stay here um, I could have my own place in Arizona um, so all of my friends at home are living in houses and I'm here with a roommate in a tiny little bedroom apartment, but that's the cost of living here, I guess. The future of the rental market here may become increasingly difficult, but there is one restrictive factor that will be able to place a cap on rental prices. It basically can't pay, right? So that's going to be a restricting factor as to how high, you know, the prices are going to go because people are just not going to be able to afford it. People are just not going to be paying the extra prices and it's just going to be kind of a, you know, it's going to stop, right? That's where you hit equilibrium, where people are just not going to be able to, to do it. The cost hopefully won't get to me, but it could. And I would imagine that's the main reason it sends people back to the mainland is the cost of living. So I'm hoping that won't happen. <laughs> if Hawaii is to meet the housing supply goal by 2025, a total of 6,500 homes will need to be built by the end of this year. For more information on the Housing Demand Report, visit hawaii.gov. When we come back, we'll find out how poo-poos and politics go together. And a closer look at an industry that could mean growing income for the Aloha State. I chose UH Manoa's College of Social Sciences because it inspires me to be bold and unafraid, to stand out, speak up, defend, and question. It's about being in my element, being engaged, and being part of something great. At the College of Social Sciences, we empower students to explore their interests, discover what they excel in, and learn how to apply their knowledge outside the classroom. Visit us today and learn more about us because life is not one dimensional and your college degree shouldn't be. Welcome back to UHM TV. The recent shutdown of Maui's last sugar plantation has opened up new opportunities for Hawaii agriculture. As Anna Gilberti tells us, hemp may offer a new source of income for the industry. Industrial hemp has been an American staple since the time of our founding fathers. It can be used as a source of food, fuel, and even construction. It's a crop that has 25,000 uses, none of which will get you high. Um, our first American flag, Betsy Ross, sewed that out of hemp fabric. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson both were hemp farmers. Industrial hemp can be planted without pesticides because the plants can grow faster than the insects can eat it. Not only that, but the plant is able to clean pesticide from the soil, a process known as phytoremediation. Thielen's new bill will complement a federal law allowing industrial hemp to be grown and regulated by the Department of Agriculture, Currently, drug enforcement agencies' rules make it difficult for hemp seeds to be imported. Industrial hemp is classified as marijuana, and marijuana is a Schedule I narcotic, so it's illegal. And it took us 11 months to get all the permits to bring it into Hawaii. Never should have been under the Controlled Substances Act. It's not a drug. And I estimate that each farmer can make $20,000 per acre. And if a farmer has five acres, he can make $100,000 per year profit. And at those kinds of dollars, you're talking real economic activity. After sugar company HCNS shut down their operation, this bill will allow its lands to be used for the growth of hemp. And that brings back jobs for a number of those workers. Leaving a legacy is not often connected with applying for a driver's license. 
But a new program being proposed would encourage teen drivers to do just that. The Legacy of Life Foundation wants Hawaii teenagers to check this box on their driver's license application to become an organ donor. A proposed bill will require driver's education courses to teach a lesson in organ and tissue donation. The hope is that teen drivers will understand what it means to give the gift of life. A lot of people may not want to do it because they don't know enough about it. We go in there and we try to educate them, to inform them. That way when they do have to make that, it's an informed decision. It's not a decision that's based on all these myths. Legacy of Life Hawaii has offered to create the curriculum as well as provide the materials to driver's education teachers at no cost. When you think of UH Distinguished Alumni, Daniel K. Inoue is a name that rises to the top. One student group on campus is making sure his legacy continues. College Hill is a place for poopoos and politics, celebrating the memory of the late Senator Daniel K. Inoue. Throughout the year, events like this bring together students, politicians, and alumni to talk about important civil issues. And it's done around food. The first thing you'll learn in Hawaii politics, food is a very important part. As a former World War II veteran, civil liberties were very important to the senator, and events like this give people a chance to discuss how it's still relevant today. I think it's quite important to remember that Senator Inoue um, was a student like you and um, graduated in, in 1950 from the University of Hawaii. We, too, have an opportunity to really shape our state and our community and our nation. Freedom, rights, equality, they're not just buzzwords, they're important themes for everyone to keep in mind, no matter what your major or future career is. We have like undergraduates and graduate students coming from different majors, um, very different and diverse background, but we're all coming together to talk about important issues like this. To sign up for future events for the DKI Distinguished Lecturer Series, check out their website. The UH Culinary Program at Kapi'olani Community College is known for producing chefs such as Sam Choi. As Brad Dell reports, the program is about to get tastier. After 20 years of planning and development, the Culinary Institute of the Pacific finally broke ground this past September. The institute will be on the 7.8 acre land of the former Fort Ruger Cannon Club next to Diamond Head. So there were several years of basically design and permitting. And then it was about money. It was about finding um, the dollars that it would take. The economy got hot, so construction prices kept rising. So we were sort of chasing a dollar there as well. So there were probably times when people thought this was not going to happen. The Institute has three phases of construction, so not all programs and resources will be available to the first students. The first phase will be complete in December 2016 for student enrollment in spring 2017. The program will include one year of restaurant business management courses and one year of advanced culinary training. This will include competition cooking, pastry cooking, and a beverage program. I think for me, I would maybe want to wait until I think the bev that beverage program is part of phase two. So I would maybe want to wait until that was finished just because that's like, it's something that for me, I would really feel a lot more well-rounded going through that program if I had that part of it. Directors of the institute and local professional chefs believe this since too will be a game changer for Hawaii's culinary scene. So there is not just quality cuisine in Hawaii where people will actually come. The Food and Wine Festival that just finished back in September attracts thousands of people. Um, chefs from around the world. Hawaii is a place to come for food. We want it to equally be a place to come for culinary education, and that's the dream. Thanks, Brad. When we come back, a look at graffiti. Is it visual art or vandalism? And we'll talk story with UH alum and former U.S. representative, Colleen Hanabusa.
Welcome back to UHM TV. She's a proud UH alum, the first female president of the Hawaii State Senate, and is now a visiting scholar at UH Manoa. Recently, I sat down with former representative Colleen Hanabusa to talk about her life since Congress. Congresswoman Hanabusa, thank you for joining me here in studio today. Oh, thank you. Nice to meet you, Alexander. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing rail? The biggest challenge is public confidence and public trust. No question. There are going to be cost overruns. There are going to be issues that either they didn't think about or it, the public isn't aware of. And those things are all tied into this whole thing about the largest project and people just being absolutely suspicious about how, what it is. And it's incumbent upon all of us to provide the answers. I have always said that the, the major cost of heart is something that people have just not thought of, which is the undergrounding of the overhead lines. And that is what people then say, well, what is this project? Who decided it's going to come down here? Why isn't it one block down? You know, those are the types of questions. And uh, you've got to tell people that it was well thought of or, or even admit, maybe this wasn't the best route, but we're stuck with it. Yeah. So let's try and figure out how we're going to make it work. And so obviously that's a role, and those are questions you're wrestling with in this public service role. Um, but you're not in elected office at the moment. No. And of course, uh, Senator Schatz is running for re-election this mm -hmm. year for a full term. Uh, you've decided not to run against him, obviously, in the primary. Mm -hmm. Does that mean this is, uh, you're at the end of your career in elected office? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> is there yeah. any particular role no. you're thinking of or would be open to? No, I've always taken the position that what, what I will do in terms of a political life would be mm -hmm. depending on what the people or what I believe is in the best interest of the state. And so I'll just stay and watch what's going on and uh, then make a decision. All right, well, we're just about out of time, but Congresswoman, thank you again for joining me here at the UH Manoa campus. Very welcome, good to see you. Coming up next on UHM TV, looking for your wildest dreams, you may not find it in Hawaii. And we'll visit a pageant that shows a different side of beauty. I chose UH Manoa's College of Social Sciences because it inspires me to be bold and unafraid, to stand out, speak up, defend, and question. It's about being in my element, being engaged, and being part of something great. At the College of Social Sciences, we empower students to explore their interests discover what they excel in, and learn how to apply their knowledge outside the classroom. Visit us today and learn more about us because life is not one dimensional and your college degree shouldn't be. Welcome back to UHM TV. Taylor Swift, Beyonce, Drake, they all have one thing in common. They're big stars who have never performed in our state. As Kimberly Speakman reports, local promoters are looking to change that. That's right, Alex. Although Hawaii has seen some famous musicians, many promoters find the venue too limited. For many Hawaii residents, getting a big name like Taylor Swift is still on their list of wildest dreams. If any big musician could come to Hawaii, I'd probably want Kanye West. I would love to see like the classics like Shania Twain. I want to see Usher still. Jazz fusion group named Snarky Puppy. Hawaii has seen some big artists throughout the years, and many of them have performed here at the Neil Blaisdell Center, including Janet Jackson and Bruno Mars. However, bringing in these famous entertainers is no easy task. Local promoters say the real challenge in attracting the stars is Hawaii's location. It's mainly cost prohibitive. I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere, right? We're the most isolated landmass in the world. So if Katy Perry, you know, has a tour where she has 18 semis worth of production to take all the gear, put it on a boat, ship it out here. Logistically, it's very complicated. An artist of that caliber has to want to play the market. Hansen says striking a deal with a big name band also includes travel costs for the headliner, equipment, and the whole entourage. For some promoters, the trick is booking musicians returning to the U.S. from a world tour in Asia, 
or reaching out to artists with Hawaii ties. While big name superstars may be few and far between, Hansen suggests that most artists will come and perform for the right price. For UHM TV, I'm Kimberly Speakman. Big artists may not come to Hawaii, but we can hear them on the radio. And the UH radio station is bigger and better than ever. Jessica Homrich reports. KTUH is playing a new tune with double the power. At 7,000 watts, fans can now hear the student-run radio station island-wide. Moving our tower where it's currently uh, at the top of Saunders Hall on campus, we're purchasing new antennas and attaching them to the HPR tower on the top of Tantalus. So it's going to give us pretty much island-wide range from one frequency, um, kind of fill in all those pockets and those listeners who weren't able to tune in before. Fans will have to switch their dials from 90.3 to 90.1 FM, but it's a small price to pay for a bigger sound. The tower switch from Saunders Hall to the top of Tantalus was a long process, and it wasn't an easy one. When a regular station, it might take them a year to get something like this done. It's taken us three years, five years because of all the extra paperwork and we're dealing with the state and the university. So it's been a huge process. Equipment upgrades cost more than $100,000, all donated by the community. KTUH is known for playing music not often heard in other mainstream media. And these volunteer DJs can keep doing what they do best. It's been a long process, but we're pretty excited to see it happen. I think it would mean like getting, more, getting the, more of the word out. Like a radio station that's like also like an avenue for other students to get their passions out and also like get their um, love for art out into, more into the community as well. KTUH has seen many changes since its first broadcast in 1969, but with this significant switch, staffers believe a bigger sound deserves a better brand. So we're getting a new logo. We're doing a new slogan. I mean, this... It's a really a great opportunity for us to completely rebrand. While music is a form of expression, so is art. Jessica Lotz explores the art of graffiti. They're on street corners, stairwells, and public buildings. But some people may question, are these markings vandalism or art? It kind of originated out of this way of like identifying like where you were from. Like to tag, you know, like identifying the street that you are on or identifying the block or identifying who you are. And that's how it started. But then it, it started becoming more and more of a reflection of kind of mimicking the art that was in the galleries. Kaka'ako is a great canvas for street artists in Hawaii, but some people might disagree. If you look at our stairway, most of it is not very interesting. So I wish that the students would try a little harder. Yeah. So I'm not care about whether it's authorized or not, it's just they're not trying very hard. While the thrill of graffiti may seem appealing, it can come with a price. The penalty of criminal property damage in the third degree could land you a misdemeanor charge with up to one year in prison and fines. You know, I don't think art is, is expanded upon any longer by materials. Like, oh, because we spent this much time on this and this materials, this is now art. But because we spent, I don't know, $5 on this spray can and we use old drywall, this is not art. So art's not defined by the materials any longer or the processes. Art's defined by the ideas behind the objects. So I think even that, even the vandalism could be art. Beauty is definitely in the eye of the beholder. Lovely Highly reports on how one woman uses her platform to educate the public about transgender issues. She's Becca by day, Bucky by night, and she's hoping to be named this year's Miss Universal Show Queen. I've always wanted to be on stage. Like I've seen all the other girls before me perform, and I'm just like, I'm going to be her, I'm going to be that. For Becca, this isn't just about the crown. The stage is her chance to speak out about transgendered issues. We get the gawking, we get the, you know, the whispering, and then, like, the point. But, you know, pay attention to that. Becca says it's sometimes hard not to pay attention when hate crimes are happening across the U.S. Last year alone, at least 21 transgendered women were murdered, the highest recorded number in history. Some trans advocates believe the recent acts of violence send the message that trans people are not real people. This is really about transphobia more than anything, right? Because people are, uh, you know, so afraid. It shouldn't matter what, what you're born as. We're human beings, plain and simple. Put yourself in our shoes, but also think about yourself, about 
What if you had a transgender child? Title or no title, Becca already sees this as a win. By bringing the conversation to center stage and inspiring other transgendered women to just be themselves. I'm actually more happy. Like, I'm more myself. I'm more who I'm supposed to be. And her advice? To live your dreams and don't let anyone tell you you're not a queen. For UHMTV, I'm Lovely Hailey. That's it for this edition of UHMTV. We hope you enjoyed our show. And of course, congratulations to the UH class of 2016. Until next time, aloha and a hui ho.